Welcome back, everyone. Welcome to day two of our 50th anniversary conference. Um, and I hope everyone um, enjoyed the, the, the drinks reception and the dinner last night. Um, the housekeeping rules, of course, remain unchanged. Um, if the fire alarm sounds, we still need to evacuate, which we'll do um, from the doors um, at the, the, the side here or, or at the back, and we'll make our way round to the Barbara Hepworth um, sculpture. Um, if we can ask you to put phones on silent, but um, we're still encouraging you to tweet and to put stuff on, on, on Instagram relating to the conference. Um, we are streaming um, live and we have an online audience um, and we are also recording today's proceedings and the proceedings will go up in due course on the college YouTube channel. So again, as with yesterday, if you don't want to be filmed, probably best not to ask a question. Um, as far as questions are concerned, obviously we do want you to ask questions. Um, and um, if you have them, if you're in the room, um, if you can raise your hand if you have a question or statement, and the panel chair will direct the roving mic towards you. If you could give your name for the purposes of recording, um, that would be hugely appreciated. Um, for the online audience, if you can use the Zoom Q&A function, um, then we will pick your questions up from there. Um, the other thing to say to all of you is that, as with yesterday, um, this is an all-inclusive cruise. Um, teas, coffees, and, and, uh, and, and the buffet lunch um, in the main dining hall. Um, do join. Uh, excellent opportunity for, for networking and, and, and talking to, to others. Um, OK. Um, the other thing is, for the speakers, um, if you haven't claimed your expenses yet, um, there are expenses forms um, on the table in the um, main concourse. So yesterday, we put the focus on the origins and the early years of the Ar Archive Centre. This afternoon, we're going to peer into the future, um, finishing with a very timely keynote from Richard Ovenden, the librarian at the Bodleian in Oxford, who I'm delighted to say is, is, is with us for the day. Um, but before we get to that, we want to showcase more of the excellent research that's been done by our Archives by Fellows. Um, and to explain why all of this is important, I want to start by playing another one of our 50th anniversary videos. Um, and we're going to start um, with um, Jessica Gardner, Cambridge's University librarian, and she, of course, just arrived in the room, um, will be appearing in person to chair our sessions later this afternoon. Okay, I'm Jessica Gardner, the University Librarian for Cambridge. Well, I'm really proud that as University Librarian for Cambridge, I'm a trustee for the Sir Winston Churchill Archives Trust, and that gives me both an insight and an opportunity to uh, help think through long-term strategies for access and preservation for the remarkable documents that are held by the Churchill Archives Centre. And with that, it's an you know, opportunity to get to know the staff, who are amazing, uh, and also to think about collaboration between the library and the Archive Centre. Uh, the Archive Centre is just a byword for incredible professionalism uh, and the depth and breadth and a richness of political, historical and scientific papers of our time. Uh, and I feel you know, so lucky both to be associated with it uh, and its long tradition of research and scholarship and public engagement, but also to be in a city where together, between the University Library and the Archive Centre, we can work to make those it's such important documents available to much wider audiences and reach new people for enjoyment and learning. So our first session features some of the Archives by Fellows who've been recipients of our prestigious Churchill Fellowship grant. Um, and when I say Churchill Fellowship, that's not to be confused with the Fellowship of Churchill College. The Churchill Fellowship um, is what was formerly known as the Winston Churchill Memorial Trust, and they've been supporting the work of the Archive Centre for some time. Um, and it's my very great pleasure to introduce the, the Deputy Chair, Mr. James Williams, who's kindly come all the way from Cornwall, although he's, he's come back because James actually was a, an undergraduate 
um, here in 1969. And I believe, James, you, you were a, a history major uh, at a time before the Archive Centre existed, when there were very few historians um, on the campus here. Um, so welcome back, um, and please come and tell us something about the work of the Churchill Fellowship, and then we will hand over to Dr. Peter Van Houten, Associate Press Professor from Polis, um, who will chair our first panel. James. Thank you, Alan. Um, and I, I have to join virtually every speaker yesterday, and I'm sure speakers today, in just congratulating what has been done at, you, with what you've done at the Archive Centre, you uh, and your team. Uh, it's an extraordinary centre of excellence, and uh, I have the feeling I'm only scratching the surface of it, and I'm inclined to come back and learn very much more. And as Alan has said, um, I was lucky enough to come here in 1969, a year after Barbara Hepworth arrived. Um, and uh, the, his, the historians at Churchill College were a very small island uh, surrounded by mathematics and science and various other subjects. But we all, um, it was very important for us to be here. And I came down from Cambridge in 72, the year before um, the foundations were laid for the Archive Centre. So those are sort of bookmarks that I've, re I've reflected on. Um, I just wanted briefly to tell you a little bit about the Churchill Fellowship. And as Alan said, we were formerly the Winston Churchill Memorial Trust. Um, we were set up uh, on Churchill's death in January 1965. Um, and we were set up with a public subscription, uh, which was basically uh, from people all over the country, generally very small amounts of money, um, to commemorate um, um, Sir Winston. And in the early days, it was 2.4 million that was set up, which that was in 1965. Um, I'm just going to give you a little quote um, from Field Marshal Lord Alexander of Tunis, um, two days after Churchill had died. He said, the great man has gone to the rest he has so well earned. We mourn his death, but we must do more. We must honor his memory by showing our gratitude to him for he did more to uphold the great freedoms under which we live than any other man in our time. And this we will, are about to do by launching an appeal which will be known as the Winston Churchill Memorial Trust. This proposal has the full support and approval of Lady Churchill and her family. And then to go on a little bit, I have a quote from Anne Seagram, who was the, the secretary to Field Marshal Lord Alexander, and she became the Trust's first administrator. Uh, she recalled, it was soon obvious that I could not cope with the thousands of appeal documents piled up in the basement of the English-speaking Union. We got some soldiers from the Irish Guards, Lord Alexander's regiment, to come and help us. And working all days of the week, we packed up parcels of the documents. Of the many responses we had, one of the most touching was from a war widow who sent a sixpenny stamp because it is all I can afford, but I want my little Jimmy to have this chance when he grows up. Millions of people contributed through house-to-house -house collections. So today, the Churchill Fellowship, very briefly on it, um, we um, offer uh, UK citizens, and this is very much the, as was laid down, um, and Churchill himself would have approved this before he died, um, we offer them the chance to travel internationally to build relationships, to exchange ideas, to learn from each other, and return with enhanced skills and confidence to contribute to their communities and professions in the UK. Uh, to quote Churchill himself, he said that the fellowship program um, relates to his belief for the betterment of world peace and understanding. People in all countries should be able to get to know one another and trust one another. After nearly six decades of um, Ch Churchill Fellows traveling, um, we believe it's proved itself a unique model for change. We have nearly, nearly this year we'll, we'll go through 6,000 people who um, have received the Churchill Fellowship. 
many of whom have gone on to become extremely distinguished in their lives, uh, often from very humble beginnings, but being inspired by the experience that they had um, to travel and to interact with people in, in other parts of the world. We're open to anyone, regardless of their age, their background, and their qualifications. Uh, and it's, I, I'm lucky enough to be on some of the interview panels when, when uh, potential fellows come to see us. And we meet the most extraordinary people, many of whom have had no academic qualifications, they haven't been to university, many of whom left school um, before they should have done. And it's, a, it's immensely um, heartening and humbling to, to, to meet these people. And the concept has remained unchanged since 1965. We are coming up um, another anniversary. We're coming up in two years' time to the 60th anniversary um, of Churchill's death and our foundation as a Churchill Fellowship. Uh, we are planning, uh, in our own way, very special events, and we're putting together a, an appeal because we think there is more that we can do um, with the existing Churchill Fellows who've traveled to be able to support them in their work and developing their skills and developing not only their skills but their outreach to other people. Uh, so to give you an example, um, we have a program at the moment, uh, people working in suicide prevention and uh, coming back from, to Britain, having seen what happens in other parts of the world, uh, a network is formed of people doing that. Um, that's just one of many, many examples. But um, we are very, very proud to be able to support the archives by offering by fellows. And I'm enormously looking forward to hearing um, about your work and your research, that what you have done. Uh, and we shall long continue to do so, Alan. But thank you all very much. Okay, well, good morning, everyone, and thank you very much, James, for these words and, of course, for the support uh, that your organization provides to the <coughs> Archive Center. So I'm Peter van Hout, and I'm a fellow at this college, and most relevantly in this context, I'm currently the chair of the college's Archives Committee, which is the committee that is uh, meant to oversee the, f run and the functioning of the, ar ar of the Archive Center, and I try to follow in the distinguished footsteps of various others that are in the room here, uh, Mark, Frank, and, and Adrian. And this is actually a job in the college, uh, a small job that is both um, very enjoyable and very easy, enjoyable, because of all the interesting stuff that's going on with the Archive Center, which I don't need to tell you, everyone is here. And also easy, because the archive, as we have also heard from many others, is, is just run very well. So I would like to express my thanks to the whole team at the Archive Center for everything they do for the Archive Center and for the, for the college. Uh, I can also report, we heard yesterday that the early years, uh, the relation between the college and the Archive Center wasn't always that smooth, but that in recent times, and certainly at the moment, it has been very smooth, I think. And I'm sure that will continue and also th on behalf of the Archives Committee, thanks to everyone who supports the Archives uh, Centre. That is, includes the researchers, actually, that come and use it. There's no point of having a, an Archives Centre if it isn't being used by research centers, by researchers, as far as I'm concerned, and, of course, by everyone that supports, uh, in small and big ways, the, uh, the Archives Centre. So that is introduction, so let's, uh, let's then get to the panel, which where we're here, uh, as we did yesterday in various panels, about all the interesting research that, uh, that has been going on, in this case, uh, done by, by fellows that have been supported by grants from the Churchill Fellowship. The first thing to say is, is unfortunately, uh, one of the listed speakers, uh, Lindsay Jenkins, is not uh, with us today. She came down with COVID and is feeling sufficiently bad that even an uh, Zoom uh, presence wasn't, uh, wasn't an option. So that is unfortunate, but we have two um, very, very good uh, speakers, I'm sure, both recent uh, by fellows here in 2022. So Jane Kifford from the University of East Anglia will go first, who 
He's still in a job at East Anglia, for those of you that have been following what's been going on there, know, know why I'm saying this. Uh, so, so that's uh, good news. And then we have Claire Knight, who is at Bristol, and uh, is in a unique position that she was both an archives assistant at some point and an archives bifellow years later. So she's in a particularly good position to talk about the archives. So without further ado, uh, Jane, the yeah, floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you. Good morning and thank you for inviting me here today for what has been a, a wonderful celebration of the Churchill Archives and thank you to the Churchill Fellowship for the financial support and a particular thanks to the Archive Centre team as well who never fa fail to be welcoming and um, indulge us in listening to our uh, forays into the Archive. Um, their interest is, is much appreciated. So today I want to do two things. Um, First of all, fly the flag for diaries as a historical source, and secondly, demonstrate that it's not just the well-known people of politicians, military personnel, and diplomats that are in the archive, but also some lesser-known individuals that can aid our understanding of the past. And we should look at these records um, of these less well-known or forgotten um, individuals. So why Blanche Lloyd? So I encountered Blanche Lloyd when researching my first book, Britain in Egypt. She was the wife of the High Commissioner for Egypt and the Sudan, George Lloyd, and her papers provided a colourful and unvarnished accounts of her time in the Nile Valley. I didn't, I must admit, consult her papers as widely as I should have, um, time being a constraint, and it was before cameras were allowed in the archive as well, so, you know, it was a, a, a very pointed dash. But I left the reading room with Andrew Riley's wise counsel that her diaries were fascinating and a wonderful resource, so I thought, one day, one day. So working on a biography of John Loder Maffey, who is Jonathan Aitken's grandfather, and for whom I'm still looking for a publisher, so if anyone has any hot tips, um, brought me into contact with, with Blanche Lloyd once again. So, so who was she? Well, Blanche Lloyd Nee Lassels was the daughter of Commander Frederick Cannon Lassels and Frederica Maria Liddell. She's also the niece of the fourth Earl of Harewood. She was born in 1881, and Blanche was the second daughter of six siblings, the youngest being the more well-known, thanks to a certain Netflix series of Alan or Tommy Lassels. Considering Blanche could count on the Liddles, the Lane Foxes, the Lassels, the Earls of Harewood in her family tree, it's perhaps somewhat surprising that there is not more references to her in the historical record. Particularly, you know, she marries George Lloyd, who is later Lord Lloyd of Dolobran, and also she leaves a voluminous written record as well. So what I will do today is to highlight a couple of excerpts from her diaries. Of course, they're mediated through my lens as a historian as well, but they showcase some of her experiences. And the diaries span the years of 1906 to 1966, and they total 33 volumes. And just to say a health warning, these reflections are still very much a work in progress. So why write a diary? We kind of touched on this a little bit yesterday. Um, two reasons, milestones and for posterity. And for Blanche, it's very much both. In 1916, she writes, after four years of very sporadic and half-hearted attempts at diary writing, I intend to try again mainly inspired by the interest George and I have found, even in the depths of war, in reading the accounts of my old adventures. I regret deeply not having kept a regular record of last year from the point of view of a woman living at home like thousands of others and doing the odd jobs permitted by the existence of a husband and child and the possibility of either or both urgently needing one. She continues, I have all my letters to George and his to me, besides his very interesting diaries, far more thrilling than anything I could have written at home. So it will be not a complete blank when we sit by the fireside at 80 and try to reconstruct the past. Unfortunately, that never happened because George dies in 1942 and he's actually referenced by Winston Churchill um, in Parliament on his death. So I mentioned Blanche's diary, keep him, you know, it was also about milestones. Um, so why had it become more important for her to keep a diary more worthwhile? 
Well, she was appointed as a maid of honour in Queen Alexandra's household between 1906 and 1911. And Queen Alexandra was the daughter of Christian IX of Denmark, and she married Edward VII in 1863. The maid of honour occupied a junior role to a lady-in-waiting, but it did mean that Blanche was able to curate an influential and extensive network of individuals such as Lady Harding, who was later to accompany her husband as the Viceroy of India, and they also presided over the visit of King George V with the Durbar in 1911. And Blanche also knew Charlotte Nollies, um, Lady of the Bedchamber, and she was the first female private secretary in the royal court to Queen Alexandra. And it's just interesting to quote there as well, you know, this is the beginning of a new life. So again, her thinking about milestones um, as she became... Um, the maid of honour. On the 13th of November 1911, Blanche marries George Lloyd, a liberal unionist and later a conservative MP at St Margaret's in Westminster, and she was 30 years old. On their marriage, the Times recorded the royal gifts that were received by the couple, and these included a pearl and diamond brooch from King George V and Queen Mary, a diamond tiara from Queen Alexandra, an emerald and diamond pendant from the Queen of Norway, and an aquamarine and diamond pendant from Princess Victoria. And the couple honeymooned, honeymooned in Paris and Istanbul. Less than a year later, Blanche gives birth to a son on Monday the 30th of September 1912 at 5.30 a.m. And he was named Alexander David Frederick, known as David. Blanche recorded, I didn't have such a very bad time as I was only taken ill at 8.30 on Sunday evening. Note the fact that she uses the word ill instead of going into labour. A few days later, however, Blanche was actually taken ill with an inflammation of the kidneys. Her recovery took almost eight weeks, at which point David was christened with Queen Alexandra and Lady Carnarvon among his godparents. Now, the nature of the Lloyd's place in society, as well as George Lloyd's career, framed the relationship between mother and son. And at five months old, David remained in Britain, whilst Blanche and George spent two months in East Africa to explore potential commercial opportunities. David boarded at Eton, and his visits to Blanche and George whilst they were posted abroad were recorded fully in her diaries. For example, on David's departure from Egypt in, 19, in January 1929, Blanche wrote, David went off on Sunday, just as sadly as ever, bless him, and it is a sad moment when we have to part with him. And when he returns for the Easter holidays in April, Blanche comments, David arrived for his holidays, though I feel I've hardly had time to look at him till today. He has grown another inch and looks very fit and is cheery and as delicious as ever. Now, although wanting to settle in the countryside once George had been forced to resign in 1929, Blanche travelled extensively both before and during her marriage. Destinations included France, Italy and the Near East before and after the First World War. But perhaps she wasn't as always as courageous. Um, on a trip to Jerusalem in 1929, Blanche and David visited the Dome of the Rock. David and his friend were very anxious to go up into the gallery of the dome. And as we climbed up the first stage of the ascent, I discovered, to my horror, that getting into the dome proper entailed emerging onto the sloping headed roof, clambering up it, and then going up a skeleton iron ladder to the leaden gallery running outside the dome. And in order to get to the door, which leads to the inside of the gallery, one has to walk about 30 yards along this very perilous path with nothing but a very thin-looking wire attached to the dome to hang on to. So when I got to the top of the ladder, I find I could not face it and rather shamefully scuttled down again. Now, Blanche accompanied George on his postings abroad to Bombay um, as he fulfilled the role of governor of the Bombay presidency between 1918 and 1924, and also to Egypt as he took on the post for High Commissioner for Egypt and the Sudan between 1925 and 1929. Now, these postings, coupled with her maid of honour duties prior to her marriage, meant that Blanche continued to cultivate a wide network of courtiers, politicians, military personnel, and other influential individuals. 
As David Lambert and Alan Lester have explored in their edited collection, Colonial Lives Across the British Empire, which focuses on the long 19th century, I advocate that imperial careering can be equally applied to those involved in the British Empire of the 20th century, and perhaps even more so. The experiences of individuals such as Blanche from the Royal Court to India to the Nile Valley, where she took on responsibilities of working with the Red Cross or fundraising for hospitals and charities, demonstrates how meaningful connections were made and remade. Now, in drawing together the threads of an individual through the prism of diaries, what can we conclude? Well, diaries provide an insight into both the individual's life as well as to the wider world that would otherwise be lost to us. The very nature of diaries like the British Diplomatic Oral History Programme interviews outline the complexities of knowledge networks and imperial connections that are woven into the life of the individual. Diaries add a texture and depth to our understanding that is simply not available in other archival sources. For example, I discovered that Diana Maffey, who's the daughter of John Maffey, suffered from diabetes that contributed to her sudden death at the age of 22. I'd been unable to find anything else as to why Diana had died at that point in time. Now, these sources recover the lives of individuals, especially women, before marriage, as well as shining a light on the invisible work of imperial or diplomatic wives. Diaries such as those written by Blanche Lloyd offer a window into the shifting kaleidoscope of the female experience during the first half of the 20th century. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you, thank you Jane, uh, Claire. Yeah. Excellent, yeah. <laughs> Um, thank you very much uh, for, I'm, I'm so happy to be here. Um, I think my journey was already mentioned. It took about 15 years to get from sitting in one of those seats there to sitting in this little seat up here, but I'm very much enjoying the moment. And I brought along my little memorabilia from when I was an archives assistant attending these kinds of conferences hosted by the college. So. Um, today I'm going to pick up, uh, not on uh, um, uh, ambassadorial wives or diplomatic wives, but in, instead on uh, diplomatic cinema or um, films, films that functioned as ambassadors. So, uh, the history of diplomatic relations between the United Kingdom and the Soviet Union was, of course, a very fraught one. The UK was reluctant to recognize the new government in the 1920s and was wary of Soviet intentions uh, throughout the 1930s, uh, one could say with, with good reason. Um, for its part, the USSR feared a British conspiracy and they prepared uh, for war, a defensive war against capitalist attack. And if we skip ahead and to the decades of the Cold War, um, and we have you know, about 50, 40 years, 50 years, riven with spies and counter spies, with double and triple agents, and all, the, all of the things that gave rise to the Cambridge Five and copious Ian Fleming and Jean Le Carré novels. Um, but amidst all of this sort of tension, there was a brief period where tensions were washed away, or at least they were temporarily drowned out. Uh, by a flood of approbation, admiration, and dare I say even affection for Russia on the part of the British public. This was the four years of the Anglo-Soviet alliance that ran from 1941 to 1945. So my current research project looks at the British media during this period uh, and its depiction of the Soviet uh, enemy turned ally. Initially, I was also going to be looking at the Russian side, but that has now been made impossible, unfortunately. Now, I've been using the Churchill Archives Center uh, for its collections on wartime radio, um, on the Aid to Russia campaign headed by Mrs. Churchill and, and her trip to Russia, um, and of course, Churchill's correspondence with Stalin, um, which perhaps surprisingly for our audience members, often drifted to the topic of films and cinema, and they used diplomatic pouches to send one another films during this alliance. Um, since cinema is my favorite form of media, I've chosen it to, to focus in on and give you a few snapshots today um, about how cinema served as a sort of ambassador during the alliance. So we'll look at three things, three snapshots. The first one, I'll, uh, we'll look at films exchanged between the governments for public viewing. 
Um, then we'll look at films exchanged personally between Churchill and Stalin. Uh, and then finally, we'll have a little snippet of, a British, of British feature films that depicted the relationship between the Soviets and the Brits um, during the times of the alliance. So first off, the film exchange between the two countries. So Russian films in the UK. The entry of the USSR into the war was met with a palpable sense of relief um, across Britain at the breathing space that this new front afforded in the Battle of Britain. This relief quickly turned into horror and sympathy at the tragedy that was unfolding as the Wehrmacht um, were steamrolling essentially through the Soviet Union. Uh, and it also turned into a vocal demand from the public that the British government do something significant to help the Allies. So to this end, Lord Beaverbrook, a fellow Canadian, um, as the Minister of War Production, adopted a very, um, shall we say, Soviet-style uh, labor campaign, um, things like Tank Week and so on, to boost uh, production, boost war production, in order to supply Russia. Mrs. Churchill, for her part, um, she, of course, with the encouragement of her husband and also Antony Eden, um, and the help of the Red Cross, set up the Aid to Russia Fund. Um, let's see here. Um, again, we see a very strong Soviet influence. The one poster there is actually a Soviet wartime poster that's been repurposed for the Aid to Russia Fund. Um, and they garnered tremendous support, very similar actually to um, what, what James was saying about the, um, the memorial fund after Churchill died. It was very small donations very often, you know, pennies and halfpennies and this sort of thing from across, um, from across the, uh, the British Empire actually. Um, but they managed to raise a total of eight million pounds at the time and this was used to supply medical equipment and other necessities uh, to the Russian ally. Uh, but these support efforts alone were not enough to satisfy the, the public demand that the government do something um, or to satisfy the, um, the popular interest in Russia that was tantamount to an obsession during these years. The British public sought not only, um, not simply to aid Russia, but also to get to know Russia and Russians, its people, its culture, its everyday way of life. And so, practically from the moment of the invasion of the Soviet Union, we see a virtual explosion of Soviet films onto British screens, thanks to both government facilitation, but also grassroots demand. Now, partnering with the London-based Soviet Film Agency, the Ministry of Information released dozens of Soviet um, newsreels, and also documentaries, and dramatic shorts. Now, there we go. Um, most of these focused on the courageous Soviet war effort, but a significant minority also showcased life in the Soviet Union, with films on women, um, the harvest, Soviet multinationality, and the Soviet uh, school child. Alongside the documentaries, uh, a great many full-length feature films also appeared, um, at first just pre-war films, uh, both new and old to British audiences. Let me see here. You are from Kronstadt, Peter the Great and this one was about a famous pilot. Um, it actually has Stalin, Stalin shows up in the film, not really him, uh, an actor who plays him, um, and he plays the perfect father in the film, of course. Um, and eventually, we also see new wartime films as well being shown on British screens, particularly partisan films like The Rainbow and No Greater Love. Now, this marked a significant turnaround for the Ministry of Information uh, and for the British Board of Film Censors, which had, throughout the 1920s and 30s, actively repressed Soviet films, such as Battleship Potemkin, um, as Bolshevik propaganda. Um, and they had made it very difficult for Soviet films to screen outside of private club showings, essentially. But even more interesting than their sudden approval for release was the way in which these films were marketed and uh, shall we just say it was very enthusiastic, the marketing. Um, so the Tatler chain of cinema theaters was particularly proactive. We can see they're pulling on the V for victory um, and the V, you know, the, um, uh, the radio campaign uh, with our, our man V in, in Europe as well. So they're tying all these, they're making all these connections and reinforcing the idea of the Soviets as our allies, um, even just in the way that they're advertising the posters, um, the, the films. Soviet films were presented as meeting the public's desire for an encounter with the new Russian friend. 
Screenings were often linked with fundraisers or Russian cultural events, and they were held around the country with surprising frequency um, and also consistency in small villages all the way to the big cities. Um, Herod's actually featured a Timoshenko display uh, in honor of the, the uh, Soviet marshal uh, Timoshenko. Now, for on the other side of things, British films in the Soviet Union, uh, there was nothing like the equivalent of uh, this sort of explosion of enthusiasm or a British craze in, in Russia, but British films were nevertheless screened. And this was quite significant because in the mid-1930s, the Soviet government had banned all foreign films. So there hadn't been British films uh, for about six or seven years on uh, the silver screen in Russia. Um, what is more, although they were limited in number, the British newsreels, documentaries, and feature films that did grace Soviet screens were accorded a noteworthy reception. Um, by that, I mean that they were very much um, sort of featured in the actual cinematic um, uh, sort of performances where you'd have a grouping of films put together. So, for instance, one Ministry of Information short, Air Women, um, was, which was about the WAF, about the women um, of the Auxiliary Air Force, um, uh, was actually incorporated into a Soviet war chronicle here, uh, a Kinozbornik, um, number six. Um, and uh, they actually featured an introduction from uh, a Soviet uh, Red Army woman who was addressing an audience of Soviet women and telling them about all the glorious things that British women were doing for the war effort. Now, one of Churchill's favorite films, Lady Hamilton, uh, from 1941, was also sent to the Soviet Union and screened widely. It became very, very popular. And now this film's interesting, of course, because it tells, uh, uses the tale of Nelson's romance with Emma Lady Hamilton during the Napoleonic Wars uh, in order to present Britain as a nation that stands alone in battle, uh, protecting the civilized world, defending Europe against a tyrannical dictator. So it's, it's a fairly clear analogy here. Um, it became an instant classic with Soviet audiences and with Stalin personally as well. Meanwhile, the British war documentary Desert Victory, another one of Churchill's favorites, uh, was actually reviewed glowingly in Pravda, the official organ of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. Um, this is the only instance, um, I specialize uh, in, in the Stalin period, Stalin, um, uh, Stalin, Stalinist cinema, and this is the only incidence I've ever found in Pravda of a mention of a foreign film, let alone a proper review and a positive one at that. It again was very popular in Moscow. So though British films didn't receive the kind of fanfare that Soviet films did in the UK, they were nevertheless granted considerable honor in the Soviet context. So there we have the, the little Pravda article. Now, on to the films exchanged between the two leaders. So they weren't just exchanged between governments, but also between Churchill and Stalin personally. They would travel from Winston's private screening room here in Chequers uh, to that of Stalin in the Kremlin and vice versa. Both leaders were known cinephiles, um, with Stalin serving as viewer number one or the top censor in the Soviet film production system. Uh, and Churchill would occasionally also take a personal interest in the industry. And it's rumored that Lady Hamilton was actually his own personal suggestion. We need a film on this. Um, and in March 1943, this personal interest of theirs was mobilized in their ongoing political jockeying around the issue of a second front. And when was Britain going to open this second front? It started when Churchill sent Stalin a copy of Desert Victory. Um, which chronicled the, the recent defeat of Rommel uh, by the Eighth Ar Army in North Africa. Um, and Churchill sent it personally to Stalin um, with, this little, uh, with this little note. The officers and men of the Eighth Army will, I am sure, be proud to know that the record of their victorious struggle will be seen by their allies, the armies and peoples of the Soviet Union. Churchill sent this film to all of his allies um, and all of the Commonwealth as well. Now, this isn't simply a request for the film to be screened widely, but it also is implying that the battle in North Africa was a sign of Britain's good faith. The Second Front may be delayed, but Britain was nevertheless proving itself a worthy ally to the Soviet Union. Stalin replied promptly, um, recognizing the film as, a, uh, as being important for the cause of our fighting friendship, but he also sent Churchill a film in response. Um, he sent him his personal copy of the Soviet documentary on the Battle of Stalingrad, 
uh, which incidentally cost 1.1 million Soviet lives. So this is a pointed reminder of the extent of the sacrifice that Britain was yet to live up to. Two weeks later, Stalin wrote again, promising the wide release of desert victory in the Soviet Union, but also throwing in another little dig. He was very good at this. Um, he wrote, I will await impatiently a similar film on your victory in Tunis. Now this victory in Tunis was of course dragging out a little bit and it still took another six weeks um, to be accomplished. A few months later, Stalin sent Churchill yet another Soviet feature, Kutuzov. Um, and this is his response to Lady Hamilton. And this, this film is about the heroic Russian general who defeated Napoleon in 1812, uh, when it was Russia that stood alone against the European dictator. It was, a, it was a film clearly in dialogue with Lady Hamilton, and it underlined the fact that though the Brits may have their victories, the Russians secured them first. The Soviet Union is always first. They invented blue jeans, by the way. I don't know if everyone <laughs> knew that. Now, Churchill himself acknowledged the coincidence of the two films in his reply to Stalin, and he even cracked a joke that neither of them would show their respective Napoleonic films to de Gaulle when, uh, during treaty discussions. <laughs> The correspondence between the two leaders was cordial and even warm at times, yet the films themselves infused the exchange with a kind of tension, um, as Stalin's films seemed to reject the claims of Churchill's films that the Brits were doing their best to defeat the current dictator. Now, on to our third topic, which is the British, um, uh, British films actually depicting um, the alliance. Oh, there we are. So this is the final snapshot that I want to cover today. Um, and uh, there are sadly no films that <laughs> demonstrate the alliance between the two. It's from the Soviet perspective. Despite Lend-Lease, they managed to defeat Hitler alone. Um, but the Brits were a little bit more uh, congenial um, and uh, made a few films that actually featured Soviets during this period. And now there had been uh, very few of these during the 1930s uh, because it had been um, very difficult to actually include any Russian or Soviet content uh, due to censorship um, during the 1930s. Uh, but this was lifted uh, a little bit during the war. So um, during these wars of alliance, we have just a handful of films. We have Laurence Olivier in the lead uh, of, as Ivan Kuznetsov in The Demi Paradise. Uh, which was also known as Adventure for Two. It was directed by Asquith's son, actually, quite interestingly. Um, and um, we also have uh, Tawny Pippet, which is, I'm, I'm gonna show you a little clip from Tawny Pippet. Um, and in this one, um, we have uh, Lucy Mannheim, who is kind of, uh, who features uh, as uh, a Soviet uh, woman sniper uh, from the Red Army. Um, named Olga um, Bakalova. Now this is a, this is a, kind of a direct reference to uh, Ludmila Pavlichenko, who was the top Red Army sniper up until 1943, when the Soviets then sent her on a kind of uh, a tour of all of the Allied nations. So she visited Canada and, and the US and Britain as well. So it's a kind of reference to her. Ironically, in the film, she's actually played by a German actress and has a very heavy German accent. <laughs> uh, I don't know what they were doing with casting. Now, both films are really primarily about Englishness. They're not about the Soviets at all. Um, the first film is essentially being, uh, is essentially Ivan's two-year struggle to understand the British sense of humor, which he doesn't quite get, but almost. Um, and the second one, Tawny Pippet, is uh, very interesting, I would say. Now, ostensibly, it's about a nesting pair of tawny pippets, which you may or may not know are, bear, uh, are birds that have only very, very rarely actually arrive in the UK. Um, and in the, in the context of the film, they've never before been seen in, in England. Um, and the, the film follows the lengths to which a heroic fighter uh, pilot who is recovering, he's on medical leave, and the nurse who is, of course, nursing him and quietly falling in love with him, um, and the entire population of a bucolic English village, um, they go to these great lengths to protect these uh, two tawny pippets from fifth columnists in the Association of British Ornithologists. Um, and these, these fifth columnists are bent on stealing the eggs for their own selfish purposes and selling them on the black market. Now, in reality, the birds uh, which, uh, which actually come, these, these birds in, in real life uh, come from Europe. North Africa and Asia, which are, of course, the three theaters of the Second World War. Um, and so these birds are actually um, a metaphor for war refugees. 
and how they are treated and protected uh, in the UK during the war. Now the part is, uh, that is most relevant for our purposes here today though, comes near the end of the film when the Soviet female sniper that I mentioned actually passes through the village, gives a rousing speech, um, and so on as part of her tour. Um, but what's really interesting is uh, the nuanced treatment of the range of, shall we say, conflicting emotions um, amongst all of the villagers um, around the appearance of this Soviet war heroine. Um, first, there are discussions among the town leaders as they prepare for her arrival about what to do about the Soviet flag. Uh, because of course they don't have a Soviet flag. Uh, they actually have a Chinese flag and they have all the other allied nations, but there's no Soviet flag in town. So they kind of cobble one together with two red ensigns and a bit of sewing. Next is the, this impulse to honor her in some way, um, but they're not quite sure what to do. So they prepare the children's choir to sing the Internationale and to present her with a telescopic rifle from World War I. Um, then we see the mixed emotions that flit across the faces of all of the people listening to her speech about defending her homeland against the enemy invaders. And that's the little clip that I just want to show you here. So you see, we shall fight to the last. The Red Army is making a good use of all the things your ships are bringing. And to the heroic comrades in the British Army, Navy and Air Force, they send their fraternal greetings. Long live the free people of Britain and the Soviet Union! you missed it, the response of the World War I veteran and the vicar as they realize who, who and what they're cheering for, <laughs> the free peoples of the Soviet Union. <laughs> so I have to say, um, having done a fair amount of research on the aid to Russia campaign and news media um, coverage of the Soviet Union during the war, I find this two minute clip from Tawny Pippet um, to most succinctly and elegantly capture the complexity of the Anglo-Soviet alliance that mixture of respect, admiration, envy, and absurdity that infused a diplomatic relationship that transformed from hostility to reliance, enmity to friendship, um, also suddenly one summer day in 1941, only to evaporate four years later, almost uh, without a trace, leaving behind nothing but the odd record of its existence in newspapers, archives, and celluloid. And so concludes my little series of snapshots my own little newsreel, if you will, on the role of cinema in the wartime relationship between Britain and the Soviet Union. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Claire. So the, we have some time now as a, part as a result of uh, having only two people on this panel. So I hope there are some questions either in the room or online. I'm keeping an eye on the online uh, Q&A. So please, for those of you that are online, please do ask questions if you have any. But are there any questions uh, in the back there? Uh, thanks. 
Uh, hi, I'm uh, Stephen Fielding. This is uh, for Claire, really, because um, I just wonder what the wider fears were that, uh, you know, amongst the, the political class about what showing some of those Soviet films might do um, to influence public opinion, to think more positively about the Soviet Union. I mean, I think it's in 1942 that the British Communist Party's membership reaches its highest ever level. I mean, it's not that much, but it's, it's its peak. So something, going, something might be going on that they're afraid that they might be encouraging. And, and secondly, this is just to say that subsequent depictions of, of this moment um, are a bit rare, but the, I know of one which is in Dad's Army. There's an episode of Dad's Army, which you may know of, uh, when, when the similar kind of meeting that is depicted in Tawny Pippet happens and Sergeant Wilson is mistaken by the Soviet for, for the proletarian, um, which of course is very ironic. But anyway, that's, uh, but I've got a serious question as well. Oh, that's brilliant. I'll have to look up. I have to admit, I've not yet, you know, tackled Dad's army, but now I know where to start. <laughs> yeah, it's an excellent question because that, that is exactly what was, what was going through the minds of, uh, of the political elite. What do we do with this sudden enthusiasm? Um, so one of the things that is, is um, carried through very, very consistently through, um, you know, all of, the, all of the editors and every newspaper and this sort of thing is they're very, very careful not to refer to the Soviet Union as the Soviet Union or the USSR, it's always referred to as Russia, and whenever possible, the Russian people. So there's that same tactic that's used throughout the rest of the Cold War then, the, you know, the, the, uh, uh, that ensues afterwards. It's, that, that begins during 1941 to 40, uh, 45. But this is actually why the Aid to Russia campaign was set up, um, because Churchill and uh, Antony Eden you know, sat down and they're like, what are we gonna do about this? We need to actually direct the, the, this popular enthusiasm, this popular sympathy for Russia into a channel that is not gonna be politically harmful. And so that is why they asked um, Clementine if she would head this up, uh, essentially. So although it, it is a kind of, it is a popular movement, it was very much, you know, um, directed very deliberately by the, by the political elite to do that very thing. And so they're very much, you know, watching all of the socialists and communists media within the UK, censorship is still very, very tight in, in those regards. Um, and then there's, but then there are these strategies to try to say, well, well, we'll direct it where we want it. And we have to remind people, this is about the Russian people. This is not about the Soviet Union. This is not about communism, et cetera. James, uh, and then Peter Sarsta. Thank you. Um, the Arctic convoys um, were obviously a point of direct, direct point of contact, if you like, whereas most of it was distant. Uh, I think I heard an allusion in that clip to the ships, but have, did you find that the Arctic convoys were a subject for films or for other media that was exchanged at all? Yeah, no, interestingly, you would think that it, it would be because the, the Soviets are um, very intent on their Arctic presence. Um, they had a, a slogan, we'll raise the temperature of the Arctic by two degrees and things like that, which is now unfortunately coming true. Um, but no, I have not yet come across anything. Um, uh, I Unfortunately, I, my research in Russia has been curtailed, so um, uh, there may have been some some radio content that I haven't been able to get across. I can access newspapers and that and the films um, from abroad, but but not the radio mm -hmm. stuff. But yeah, no, it's 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 one I would have expected to see, um, but have not yet found. Yeah, good point. Piers, thanks. Um, Piers Brendan, um, it's a fascinating uh, account of the films. I, I wonder whether you've done any comparative research about what went on from Hollywood. Um, Charlie Chaplin, as you know, got into terrible trouble by, for um, advocating a premature second front and so on. Um, but the most famous film, I guess, altogether, was Mission to Moscow, wasn't it? Ooh. And, um, I mean, that's a fascinating film as, as, an, as an exercise in propaganda. And I suppose the most amusing feature of it was that it was so grotesque in elevating Russia to saintly status because it was the victim of the Nazis that um, when the film was actually shown in Russia, 
audiences laughed at it because they thought it was so, so ludicrous. It painted such a favorable picture of Russia. So these things have a, um, a, 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 a two-edged sword, really. And I'm just wondering, because it seems to me Hollywood was much more powerful as a, as a, uh, as a, um, a, a cinema, cinematographic uh, enterprise than Britain was. I'm wondering you know, what, what you can say about the Hollywood uh, yeah. picture. Yeah, there's definitely, there's a lot more to say about the, the Hollywood side of things. Even just the fact that um, they were screening Soviet films throughout the entire you know, uh, period, uh, the 30s. There was, a, there was a Soviet company set up in New York um, but what's really interesting about the Hollywood wartime films about the Soviets is that they were actually requested by Roosevelt. He um, requested that like um, a Metro Golden Mare and, and other um, production companies make films that would teach Americans to love their Soviet ally. Um, and of course there are some documentaries um, that along that lines, but I, th I think that the feature films are the most interesting. Mission to Moscow was not, very widely circulated in the, in the U.S. at the time. It was a little bit too over the top. I show the trailer to my students who are taking Life and Death with Stalin uh, with me in their final year, and they, they're shocked just at the trailer because it, it's so outrageous. It's worse than any Soviet propaganda you could ever hope to see. Um, but, um, but there were much more subtle films. Um, in fact, Gregory Peck made his feature film debut um, playing a Soviet, um, or no, playing a, an American who falls in love with no, wait, no, he is a Soviet, he is a Soviet, um, he does a funny accent, um, who falls in love with a ballerina, a, a Russian ballerina, and they become partisans together, and I think he dies throwing himself in front of a tank. I, I don't remember quite the, the, the details, obviously, but there are um, a number of these, and then there's Star, Star in the North, um, and they're, they're, they tend to focus on partisans. Um, that was a much safer um, you know, topic. Even the Soviets themselves are making films about partisans up until, they don't make films about the Red Army until 1945 um, because the Red Army had lost so, so badly initially. So the focus for um, international cinema was really on the partisan resistance, but it's wonderful. And then uh, after, of course, um, um, Samuel Mayer got in trouble for some of the films that he made, pro-Soviet films, and was called up by McCarthy in the 50s, you know, he was demanded to show up for a meeting, and he was just like, no, Roosevelt told me to do it, I'm not showing up for this meeting, so. Yeah. Jonathan Hart. Um, it's interesting because of all the gyrations of propaganda, because if you look at Churchill's speeches in Parliament, he wasn't very pleased about the British Communist Party and, and how it hadn't really supported Britain in his view. And in the United States not coming into the war, um, very conveniently as often people forget the, the pact between Russia and the Nazis and how they were carving up Eastern Europe and fighting over things like who gets Romania and so on. Um, so it's, it's interesting to see how obviously that's in some kind of public record, yet they're exchanging films. So it, uh, Stalin's phrase, I think, that you used was sort of friends in arms. And you get this kind of mythologizing, which Putin does, where he's born in a city in Swedish land, and that's not part of the narrative. Um, and you know, the University of Tartu is an old Swedish university, even though it's in Estonia. So it depends where you draw the line, but it seems just with this kind of film, it's like, oh, last year or the year before, they were our enemy or they, you know, whatever. Now they're our great friends, and how do we bend ourselves out of shape? But I love that thing that they're both, um, both, uh, I suppose, uh, fellows in freedom. Um, so I, I wondered how you experienced this in your research, how you get this kind of mythology of democracy and fighting against dictators um, in this kind of, uh, these propagandic films. Yeah, yeah. It's really interesting because um, that concept, although the, on the Soviet side, although the, the Bolshevik party you know, has framed themselves as defenders of democracy and of having developed a true form of democracy that is led by the one party um, and this kind of thing. It, it's all of that um, more intellectual ideology it gets completely sweeped to the side 
um, during the war on the Soviet side. So they're not actually talking about defending freedom or democracy, they're talking about defending the motherland. Um, and again, motherland was that the term for it, um, Rodinamat, was actually banned um, during the early period in the Soviet Union uh, because it should be the socialist fatherland, right? And we shouldn't be defending a nation. Um, so, so all of these kind of much more, um, uh, the much older myths essentially uh, come to bear on the on the Soviet side. But in the film, yeah. the is about freedom. Yeah, yeah, which is from not. The English, from the English side, which is yeah, serious. it is, it is. So we can see they very much put some words in her mouth, <laughs> in her German accented mouth. Okay, uh, Ellen, yeah. thanks. Thank you very much. Um, I just want to, to, to widen this back out a, a little bit. Um, and I just want to ask, well, I want to thank both our, our panelists, first of all, for excellent presentations. But then I, I just wondered um, where you go next with your research. What are, what are the, the research outputs for you that are coming out of this? Oh, gosh. Uh, I don't want to this is a good question. Um, First of all, I obviously want to, to finish the biography on Maffey, which, you know, was the reason why I came to, to Churchill. Um, and kind of working on Blanche was as a happy side project as well. Um, I think edited diary, maybe, but that's a lot. It's 33 volumes to squish down, which would be <laughs> quite a task. And she meets so many people. And from having done Earl Page's British War Cabinet diary to write all of those mini biographies is a massive task. Um, so this is, I think, if I do anything with her diaries like that, it will be, you know, a, a really big project. But I think this whole idea about Imperial careering, it's something that I've come across with, with Maffey. Um, and that, you know, you go to all of these postings and you take those experiences that you have. He went to the Northwest Frontier, then the Sudan, and then he was Britain's first representative to air on the outbreak of the Second World War. And all of those experiences that you have in those places, you take on to your next posting. And how does that inform how you deal with Eamon de la Vera uh, when you've been dealing with the indigenous tribes on the Northwest Frontier and, you know, the abduction of Molly Ellis and things like that? So I think that idea of imperial careering is, is really important. And, and should be looked at through the, the life of, lives of an individual rather than looking at them in, in sort of sections as to if you're looking at Britain and Egypt for a particular time and you just come across this individual and you don't really understand their formative experiences. And then I think, you know, you can broaden that out to, to people like Blanche that has a, a very different interaction. She's meeting all of these people in the same way and has very specific opinions. I mean, she's a bit of a difficult person to like, I think, when you read her diaries. Um, but again, she's having those experiences and um, talking to different people. You know, when George is getting kicked out in 1929, she goes to Stanley Baldwin, you know, things like this. She's a very sort of, you know, vocal advocate um, in her own right as well, and I think that gets forgotten. Um, so I'm not sure if that quite answers your question about outputs, but, you know, I really want to do, you know, the Maffey biography and something on Blanche Lloyd taking that theme of imperial careering um, through. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> No, uh, Netflix series, that's what I'm interested in. <laughs> if anyone has any connections. Um, no, I, I, I'll be doing you know, the standard academic um, publishing of articles, but what I would really like to do is write a much more popular history. Um, and before the war um, in Ukraine, I, was, I, was, I had the title down, which was When the Brits Loved Russia. <laughs> I think I need to sit and wait a few years before I try to send that to Penguin or, you know, these kinds of things. So, um, I'm, but I'm currently um, on a secondment that's a non-research post, so I'm, I've got three years where I can't really do my research um, too rigorously at the moment. So that'll hopefully things, you know, miracles will happen. Um, somebody will overthrow Putin, somebody democratic and freedom loving, <laughs> but we'll see. Yeah. Uh, thank you again, uh, David Walner from the Roosevelt Institute. I uh, really enjoyed both both panels. I'm glad the FDR came up with Metro Golden Meyer. He certainly deserves to be mentioned in this context. And I just wanted to say, we, we did a, uh, the FDR library did a, a wonderful exhibit, a uh, temporary exhibit on posters from the Second World War. Fantastic. And the ones depicting the, the Soviet army were extraordinary. And the one I remember the most, I wish I had a copy of it here to show you, was the wonderful picture of a Soviet soldier. Um, and uh, the headline was, this man is your friend. He fights for freedom. <laughs> so yeah. that goes what 
our, our colleagues were saying. Yeah, okay. that's brilliant, yeah. Miriam? <laughs> Sorry. Wait, wait, wait for the microphone thing. Mm -hmm. um, so um, in the occupied countries during the Second World War, uh, the Nazi propaganda went very heavily on population. So um, I guess they were aware, I mean, the Allied who, who, who were not occupied were aware of that. So how far was it an inspiration to do something in, in uh, uh, with cinema? And I've got a question for Blanche as well. Um, a number of, uh, I like your, your, uh, your phrase, uh, imperial curing. I think it's a very good one to describe what happened to many women, many wives uh, at the time. Now, uh, a number of these women uh, chose uh, various forms such as a travel narrative or uh, would be domestic advice to uh, indigenous servants or that sort of thing. So did she, did she choose one of these formats or was it sort of a, a description or an everyday description of what happened or, you know. Um, in terms of um, like the, the British films, they were only ever screened domestically. So there wasn't a vision to kind of spread the word as it were. And I think they're probably prioritizing more films centered specifically on, on the British sort of experience. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, her diaries are very much an everyday description, um, so they can range from the, you know, I had breakfast, um, to I went and met Stanley Baldwin's day, um, you know, so yeah, the, it, it's a very diverse um, recording of her everyday, um, so it is, is everything from, from the domestic to the political, to the travel, to the family. Um, she writes a lot about her siblings, for instance. There's references to Tommy Lassell's. Um, so, yeah, it, it, it is all encompassing. They're not um, entirely, you know, there's breaks in between her diary. For instance, there's, no, there's nothing for the first two years of the First World War, which is rather frustrating, um, you know, and things like that. So it's not a continuous from 1906 to, to 1966. But, yeah, it, it pretty much covers everything. And that's what makes it such a big project as well, isn't it? Because it, there's so much to digest um, in that. So, yeah, thank you. Alison? and 60s, I had the impression that Russian culture and Russia was still quite popular in spite of all the revelations about Stalin. Um, so, for example, people used to go and see the Red Army Choir. It was the Red Army, you know, everybody knew that, and this was in the 60s. Mm -hmm. um, people learned Russian. It was a popular language, not just because it was perceived to be popular, uh, perceived to be useful in the Cold War, but just in itself. And I read Modern Languages at Girton, and very remarkably, in my year, there were more of us doing Russian than were doing German. Um, so I wonder if you might look at some of the populist aftermath, if you like, that it wasn't just that Britain loved Russia during the war, you know, even after the revelations about Stalin, that there would continue to be a residue. Hang on, uh, uh, we're starting to actually slightly run out of time, at least two more people, so I suggest we do these questions. Uh, collect them and then uh, you answer them. So there's Dan and then there's Christoph. <laughs> I'm, ooh, how do you see your hope? Um, this is for Jane. When you were looking at Blanche's diaries, did you look at the diaries themselves is to sort of see who she sort of was, what the conditions they were in, what sort of um, like brand of diary she actually wrote in to sort of give an insight of who she was and what sort of things she um, wrote about and stuff? Yes, mine's also for, for Jane. Um, one of the things we talked about yesterday was with soft power and hard power. And it was often the wife of a senior person, like the person, you know, wife of somebody like George Lloyd, obviously probably did have a lot of soft power. You know, and did you find anything about that? You know, that where she was actually, well, she was actually playing a, quite a major role behind the scenes. You know, that she was actually more powerful than just being George Lord's wife, which it would suggest. Are there any other questions? Because then I'm going to ask both. There's one in the back there, and then we ask. You get a chance to <laughs> answer all of them. <laughs> and there's one more question there. I think. Yeah, I think I'm the only one Asian here. I'm Chinese, I'm from Singapore. I'm doing IR research now, so I'm also an independent 
journalists. Thank you very much for the family, the, uh, the fantastic movie I have ever seen before. What do you think, um, uh, Asian country like during that period, 1941 to 1945, and ASEAN countries fighting, you know, was, um, I think that time, Singapore still colonial by British, yeah. So what do you think that appears as cinematical in South Asian countries and ASEAN countries? I think ASEAN country was heavens published. So what, it, what do you think? Thank you very much. And there's one final question on the top. And then <laughs> I hope you can manage this. <laughs> I'm going to give everyone the opportunity. <laughs> Thank you. If you'll, uh, Stephen Wright is my name. If you'd allow just another question about Blanche Lloyd, um, I, the short excerpts which Jane read were illustrated her, her vividness, her, her capacity to write, which is really impressive. But um, your, your um, uh, selections were about her in the grand imperial days. I wonder given that you said, I think, that she continued until the 1960s, how Blanche dealt with the more modern times, firstly, the privations in the Second World War and the difficulties of the Second World War, but also the period of decolonization and the end of empire. Thank you. Okay, well, the, the easy task to our two panelists to answer all these uh, questions now to wrap up, so who wants to go first? Okay, uh, look, yes, I did look at the physical copies of the, the diaries, the poor archives team are bringing them all out, the 33 volumes for me. Um, they do change, like one of the early ones actually has like a sort of lock on it, um, the middle period of her life, um, there's quite a lot of space to write, um, but as the, the goes on, sort of the diaries from the 50s and 60s are kind of like the half page ones. Um, so, you know, a day to half a page. Um, so it does get less um, as, as she gets older. Um, and to, to answer Stephen's question uh, with that, I haven't got to the Second World War yet. <laughs> <laughs> I've been furiously trying to transcribe them. Um, after learning to read Maffie's writing, handwriting, her writing is an absolute dream to read now. Um, so, yeah, it, it'll be interesting when it gets to that, and particularly, obviously, when her husband dies and how she kind of copes with that and how then she creates her life um, in sort of, you know, a, a more rural countryside place and kind of how that, you know, uh, what happens. I know David comes and visits quite often and things like that, and she always records that. She records the weather a lot um, in the later diary, so it'll be interesting to see how that, how that changes and whether she does reflect on what's going on in the wider political um, developments there as well. Um, so just take that. And Christopher's um, soft power question. I mean, yeah, uh, I think... I mean, the one question that I ask myself is considering George Lloyd obviously himself gets married quite late on, is he marrying because of the, her family connections and her royal connections? That's something I've been asking myself. I don't know whether I'll actually ever find out the answer, but I mean, she does give him quite a you know, elevation um, in, in that way. And, you know, she's still, they, when they visit Windsor, she sort of says, oh, it's like coming home, um, you know, things like this. So, you know, and obviously with David Borden at Eton, obviously, you know, Windsor Castle overlooks Eton. Um, so, you know, again, sort of bringing him into that world as well, I think. Um, but that's one of my, my little questions I've got in the back of my mind. Does he marry her? Because she is, you know, with the the Lassels, the Liddles, the Lane Foxes. She's, she's quite high up there, right? Which is why I'm so surprised that there's nothing more about her. Um, so, yeah, I, I think that was all of them. <laughs> <laughs> a very good job, Claire. Claire. Yeah, great point. Once we get into the thaw and the um, Khrushchev's push to, you know, build the friendships of peoples, I think we're in, we're in a totally different ball game because that's when we really do see the rise of soft power deliberately, you know, and um, and we start to see in the late 40s the Soviet Union framing um, not just the current war, the Cold War, but even the Second World War as a war of cultures, um, and so we definitely see that, and um, I would say it's a kind of a, a real turning point. Um, once, once Stalin dies and, and things begin to open up a bit. Yeah, 
Um, and then for, for Asia, I'll have to admit this is, this is a real area of ignorance for, for me, um, especially the, the 1940s. Um, but yeah, I think it would be a really fascinating study to look at. I know in, in Soviet films uh, during the war and after the war, um, the Asian presence is really important. So there's always, there's always a, a good Soviet um, of uh, Asian background in all of these war films to demonstrate you know, that uh, Soviet socialism appeals to the entire globe and holds the solutions for, uh, for the Chinese people as well. And uh, so I think that would be a really interesting question to follow up on for sure. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much. I think we then come to the end of this panel. So thank you very much to the two presenters. Excellent presentations. <laughs> excellent Q&A, so thank you very much. And, and I think there is now coffee in the, in the buttery, I assume, like yesterday.